Good evening, and welcome to Africa's Vision Network. Africa's Vision Network features African cultural awareness, education, economic empowerment, religion, spirituality, and other issues focusing on the African world. I am Princess Ayo, your host for the show. Our program this evening will focus on Miss Amanda Sullivan Rudd and her rise from prejudice to the seat of power. We are pleased to have you as our guest. So excited to have her. I've been having conversations with her earlier and it is amazing. You're going to love this show. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Little Amanda Sullivan was born and reared in the segregated South in the rural area of Greenville, South Carolina. She was the seventh of 12 children born to Wesley and Delarian Moore Sullivan. The number seventh has special significance in the Bible, representing completeness and perfection. God blessed Amanda. She had wonderful parents that gave her a firm foundation for the many challenges she would confront in life's journey. She was blessed with a wise sage for a mother and a protective and caring father. Her father was a farmer. Her mother took care of the children and was active in the church and the community. Her parents were very religious and ensured that she and her siblings were rooted and grounded in God. As a child, she began teaching Sunday school, playing the piano, and singing in the choir. Possessing a curious and inquisitive mind, she developed a passion for books and reading. Excelling in high school, she graduated as valedictorian. She received a major in education and a minor in library studies from Florida AME University in Tallahassee, Florida. In 1962, she received a master's in library science from Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Amanda has appeared in Ebony Magazine and several other publications. She holds the distinction of being the first African-American and woman to head the Chicago Public Library, the largest in the country. Amanda is a world traveler. Her position as consultant to World Book and commissioner of the public library took her to many countries around the world. She has given presentations in countries like Japan, India, Mexico, Sweden, West Germany, and many others. Today at 82, can you believe it? <laughs> she is retired and living in Arlington, Virginia. However, she still gets itchy feet and travels to other countries whenever she has the opportunities. She is concerned that her extended family remains connected. She is the proud mother of a daughter, Loretta, and a son, Grover Cleveland. Again, welcome to our show. It's wonderful to be here. We're so excited to have you. And, you know, like I told them, had a great conversation with you earlier. So we'll just keep on going and hopefully fill them in with some of the stuff I've learned about you. You know, tell us uh, to start a little bit about your childhood and uh, your early adulthood in the segregated South. In the segregated South, the schools, because of my parents uh, just overwhelming uh, desire that we would be educated. Mm -hmm. they, they, made, they made us understand that was the way to get ahead. The schools were bad. For example, in the elementary grades, uh, grades one through seven, two teachers okay. uh, hand me down books from the white schools and no library and no resource material. And so additional material and learning was, was quite limited. Uh, but my, my whole family and I kept the desire to learn. Our parents installed it. And then uh, when I was, uh, oh, about 10 or 11, I went to a private school, a church school, mm -hmm. um, and we were walking down the street one day in a white neighborhood, and we were walking along talking, and I saw the people sitting in the living room uh, reading the paper in these beautiful homes, and I made my desire to myself, and I didn't say a word to anybody else until I was, after I was adult, mm. that I wanted to live like that. But I knew that to live like that, you had to get an education because my father had a work ethic. You must earn. That's the only mm. way to do it. And of course, then eventually I went on to high school. Again, no library. Hand me down books and kind of some and more. And it was a segregated same. high school? Yes, of course. Was it the same yeah. thing with two, just a uh, two teachers or how many teachers? No, there were six teachers as I remember in the high school. 
And I did have one, uh, uh, one teacher that I remember very much, Vivian Sample, who uh, encouraged my quiz curiosity of mm -hmm. nature, as she said, Amanda's curious, and that's good, and keep it. And I have it to this day. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. I want to learn everything. And there's always one teacher, <laughs> isn't there? Yes. Who really yes. gets us going. Um, now, you formulated your goals at an early age. Yes. Tell us about how you did that. Well, it was, it was in my mind. And, and it, it was so far removed from the realities of the time that uh, I didn't say anything to anybody about it. And you were like nine years old mm -hmm. when you were? And, and at that time, I, I, I knew that I wanted to get an education. And then uh, after high school, see, then I went to junior college for two years. Mm -hmm. And that was my first real learning experience. There I had a library mm -hmm. and uh, wonderful teachers. It was a college, a Voorhees College in the lower part of the state. And um, uh, it was just a great experience. In South Carolina? In South Carolina. But the interesting thing is the educational levels continued because in the black schools, two years of education you could teach school. Hmm. But the white schools required their teachers to have the BS, a BA degree. Okay. So of course I came out teaching at the age mm. of 18. But uh, internally it was a, a real problem. I wasn't prepared for it, and I knew I wasn't prepared for it. How do you get prepared for it when you've had this paucity of education mm. and experiences? And so I was studying harder than the students to try to bring them. Okay. And it's painful to have that responsibility and know that you're not giving them what mm. you really want to give them. That's, that's the problem with segregated education, the biggest problem. Right. As far as and I it's amazing that you had that desire to go to school even though you were in that situation. Do you feel like you were sort of, not trapped, but there was no other way because of the way your parents brought you up? Well, uh, my mother used to talk about hope and what you could do. And she realized that from her life and, and the way she was, things had improved for her. But we had a dream. For instance, my mother always believed in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, she, would, she would call Wes, my father, to say, I need 35 cents to extend this subscription. And she read to us. Mm -hmm. She read to us. We didn't understand. Sometimes she didn't. But she always did. And to this day, I'm, I must start my day with the newspaper. Mm, I must try to start doing that myself <laughs> on this age. But you know what's amazing about your story, and of course I read some of the articles that uh -huh. the audience has been able to see, was the amazing story of you boldly trying to enter an all-white library in Greenville, South Carolina. Tell us about that. Oh, that was, that, was, that was interesting. Now, see, when you grow up with seven brothers, uh, you, you, you spend a lot of time with your mother mm. because the boys didn't want me <laughs> with them. They didn't want me to be a tomboy. And then I said, I go in the house with mama. And so that meant that I went a lot of places with them. Mm. And on Saturdays when we'd go uptown and they would be shopping, I could stroll around down, uptown by myself. So I saw this building and I went to the door. Now, I don't, I, don't, I don't know that my thoughts was anything except what's in this building. I was standing in the door looking. And how old were you? I must have been about eight years old Still or something like young. that, mm. young. And, and the lady came to the door, and she wasn't mean. She just said, uh, you can't, I'm sorry, you can't come in. And she told me where, uh, where a black library was. And uh, she said, but you can't come in here. And I walked away. Mm. And it was rather interesting when later, and I, we'll talk about this later, uh, this got the press's mind, but when uh, uh, one of the reporters asked me, what did your parents say when you told them? And I said, I didn't tell them. And she said, why? Why would you not go to your parents? I said, what could they do? Mm. I said, my father wanted to have us to have everything that he could give us and that we wanted. I knew that that was a segregated library. I knew what it was. He couldn't open the door, so why make it painful for him? Mm. See, that's all it would have done, mm. given him pain, that he couldn't produce something that I really right. needed. That so I kept it to him. myself. Mm. <laughs> Do you think your parents prepared you at all for that experience? Uh, yes, in that uh, my father set 
a wonderful example. Uh, there was not hate in our, in our okay. family. My father helped the white and the black. He, he when they, the, the uh, horses or someone was in trouble, they came, they called West. He sent the boys to help wherever they could. My mother read the Bible, talked to us. We went to church often. And of course, you, as you know, in, in the South, we, you had more than one parent. The neighbors were also parents, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so that was that positive, that positive feeling in the home. And we always, we always had hope. And I think that is, that is so important that we do have hope uh, because, thing, you know, Things can get better. Mm. Tell us about your church, New Prospect Baptist. Oh yes, you had work in there. Yes, that was that was a church, and it it's it's uh, has landmark status, and it's just wonderful. Mm. We we love it. All of us were baptized at that church, all nine of us who who survived, and uh, we were active in the church, and we had to. You just automatically did it. You were ushering or doing something. And uh, we went regularly. Nobody talked about not going to church as mm -hmm. they do now. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> you went to church. Right. And, um, and we had the teachings. The golden rule is what I always say, mm. and, and love everybody. And love was there, and, and we saw our parents doing for the neighbors and friends, regardless of race or situation. And we had that feeling in us, and it happens to this day. My family, I have a brother that just literally spends his time caring for others. Mm. And um, that's a part of us, and we feel good about it. My right. children also are that way, thank goodness. So it was just as important as the schooling. Oh, yes, was going oh, yes, to church, that was right. Because, because that kept the desire alive. Mm -hmm. So you can go to the school and you wonder, how do you ever come out of this? But um, we did. And mm -hmm. when I went to junior college, uh, I didn't play around. I, I tried to take advantage, you know, read, look, explore, ask questions all the time, mm. you know. Tell us about your experiences as an educator. So now you've finished um, junior high, is that junior college? Yes. And you're, you're an educator. And you were a librarian yeah. at that time too? Well, what happened is that I married a serviceman. This is, we're talking World War II now. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, for my, in my quest to get that BS degree, I, uh, one summer, was able to go to summer school and get 12 hours. I took a, a, a correspondence course from the University of Minnesota for some more hours. And then we moved around a bit. We moved, uh, lived at um, bases all over, including Alaska. And um, when we went to Florida, we were near Florida A&M, and that desire was so. So my, uh, my parents kept my oldest child and I mean my, my youngest child Loretta mm -hmm. and and he kept her while I went to Tallahassee and for one year and got my degree mm -hmm. now the interesting thing is when I got my degree came back we were living on the base and directly across the street was the base elementary school but my son was bussed off the base the little bus stopped in front of the door and picked my child up and we bust him into Fort Walton Beach, and there was a school across the street. Mm -hmm. Well, when I graduated in Maine, came home, I saw an advertisement in the, in the base paper. They needed teachers. Well, I applied. And so the attorney general called me in to the office and said that they had a vacancy. I had the qualifications. I had graduated with honors, and uh, but the, but they needed a librarian, and would I consider, since I had a mind in librarianship, would oh I consider goodness. that? And he said, I'll be quite frank with you, we think this is the place for you because you, the students will not, you will not have to interact with mm -hmm. the adults. Wow. You know, and, and then he said, and if we give you the job, I want you to promise me that you will, uh, if any occurrence comes up, anything to Tom, that you will just quietly walk away and you can be sure that your salary will be taken care of. Hmm. And, and I don't know if he thought I promised, I just looked at him, I did, <laughs> I, you know, I wasn't gonna commit to that. <laughs> but it was a wonderful year. It was a wonderful year and my, my, my son, you know, was, was in the fifth grade So then grade they brought there. him back. We were right across the street. And so uh, I had only had to rebel one time when they were having a, a 
uh, uh, some fundraiser at the school, and I wanted to leave. And the, and the MPs told me I couldn't drive my car out. Mm. And uh, that's when I found out that I could. And I said to him, uh, I can't go to that school. My son can't go to that school. And you're going to tell me I got to stay in my home? No way. Mm -hmm. So the base commander was called, and he said, <laughs> let Mrs. Rudd go where she wants to go. <laughs> Causing a ruckus. Did the early education and college um, experiences that you had prepare you, do you think, for the positions? Oh, yes. Oh, there? yes. I, um, I went, well, well, let me quickly tell you what happened with the college. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was teaching and then decided I wanted to get my master's. And so Florida, Florida, um, Florida State University had a library school. So I'm getting ready to apply there. And my next no neighbor, neighbor, who was a white woman from Canada, told me about the, uh, uh, what was available for students if they wanted to go to college. They would not be admitted in the South, but, mm -hmm. but, the, but they would, Florida State, the state would pay my expenses to go to any library school I wanted to go to. Well, I took them up on that, and, and so, hence my, my family was living in Cleveland, and I came to Cleveland and was able to get started there. Oh. Um, it, was, it was a good experience. The one thing that was, was really kind of bad, and, I, and, I, and I, I think it's racial, but anyway, it affected me. I, I took children's work, and it was, um, uh, you know, it's a 32-hour course, and I was finishing. Now, I, went, I now had a divorce. I had two children I was around. They were going to college <laughs> if I had to work no five job. jobs. <laughs> and so I needed this raise that came with it. And it was a two-hour storytelling course. And for two hours, Case Western Reserve had that course in the, e in the morning. And, and I kept asking, are we going to have it? So one day she said to me, if it's so important to you, why don't you take a leave of absence and take the course? Hmm. Okay, I don't need to expand on that. <laughs> but the next semester I did, they took it and I was able to graduate. And then we had a new superintendent who came in and wanted schools and uh, libraries in all of the schools. And this was his, his mission. And he, he looked and saw that I had a library degree and he asked me to come and uh, help start the program. Two months after I was there, I became the assistant director of um, Assistant Supervisor of School Libraries in Cleveland, Ohio. Wonderful experience. Wonderful, wow. wonderful. Yeah. I mean, from the time you were a child, though, you weren't thinking of being a librarian. No. But you did have that little experience with the books. <laughs> yes, that was there. But I had I'd always seen books as, as, as a point of information. I see, we, remember, we didn't have this explosion of knowledge with, with all of the automation you have now and mm -hmm. internet and so on. Mm -hmm. You read for your information. Mm -hmm. And so that was important to me. And it was also important to me that the children had this experience. Dr. Briggs, the superintendent, said, that no emphasis on return of books as librarians do. I never was one to emphasize that. He said, and I agree with him, if a child took a book home mm. and got pleasure from it and never brought it back, mm -hmm. it was all right with him wow. if he got pleasure. He said books are to be used not to sit on the shelf and take care of. Mm. Wonderful to work with that him with that is. kind of support. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Mm -hmm. Did you experience... Um, any prejudices while you were on the job in, as a in, librarian? As a librarian uh, in, in Cleveland. Uh, it was there. One, of the, one interesting thing was um, I, they, before I became a librarian, I was teaching, and they were going to uh, set up a program for reading consultants to help youngsters with reading. I applied for it, was assured I was going to get it. And I went away to the University of Illinois to a conference, and I gave the address, and I was told I would get it. And as I say to my friends now, uh, I, I'm still waiting to hear from them. 
<laughs> Goodness. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know, and, and I'm, I'm so hard and believe so much in honesty and accountability. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know how you can, someone can sit and look you in the face and say, you have the job, <laughs> I will, you know, I will send you your papers and never send them. I, I don't understand that. Mm. <laughs> I'm naive, I guess. Wow. So. <laughs> but it's amazing that you just keep on having that positive oh, yeah. attitude. Yeah. God's and been good on. to me. And so you moved on and you were in a position at the World Book Encyclopedia. Yes. Tell us how that came about. Well, uh, one day my secretary, I, I've always had wonderful secretaries. I, God blesses me Blessing there. again. And so we, we got a little angry with the supervisor. You know, how you in there? You're a little angry. And so <laughs> she said, it's time for you to leave here. There are better jobs somewhere. <laughs> she said, um, there's, there's consultants places and you would make a good one. And so she went over and pulled the first volume of World Book out and looked in there and there was, she said they have an education department. And she said, I'm gonna write a letter for you. And I said, oh, I'm happy now, I'm not mad, you know, that was it. <laughs> she wrote the letter and it came, it was kind of good. I signed it and sent it. And that they wrote me right back saying that they were impressed with my resume. They didn't have a vacancy, but they would put it on hold and so on. And so, you know, I never thought anything about it. Six months later, I got a call. And this was my first big step mm. into professionalism at mm. that level, supervisors. And so they said, look at your calendar and see when you can follow for, for an interview. They were in Chicago and I was in Cleveland. And so I tried not to go the next day. I waited until the next week and gave them, the, gave them a time. And I flew over and was immediately, I, I got the job. They had me meet the wow. president of the company. And I was one of, uh, f uh, one of five um, consultants. Okay. I was the only black person there. Was, it a, was there a limit on the job, or big part? Was there a limit on the job, like consultant for two years? No, it wasn't no like limit, that. No limit. No uh, limit. And I had eight midwestern states, from the Dakotas to Texas. Okay. And um, I, I established my my office in Chicago rather than Dallas, where it had been before. And it was a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. I traveled the United States over, and it was a it's a, it was a wonderful company to work for. We went first class and everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I just enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. It was just great, just great. If you don't mind, talk about how you talked when the camera wasn't on about how in your first job you realized the perks of oh, really yes. working a great job. Uh, yes, because when, 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 I was, when, you, when I was teaching in Cleveland, um, Things that you had to do, extra things. For instance, I was asked to teach a demonstration uh, lesson on the new math when it came out. Well, the, you know, say the preparation for that was done at home in the evening mm -hmm. after I prepared my children's dinner and mm -hmm. fed them and, and then went, put them to bed. Then you went to work on the extra things you had to do. Now I get the world book and wow, you know, when new, new products came out, we had a week, two weeks, how long it takes to do nothing but study those. Mm. I thought, what in the world is this? Um, all, all kinds of things like that. Um, they wrote complimentary notes all the time. I did not feel, I did not feel any prejudices in that company. Okay. Uh, uh, there, there, there were a couple of times uh, something uh, came up, but they were not they were not anything that I remember. I just remembered it as a great experience and i i 've always worked to, to try to do it the right way mm -hmm. for instance when when I was called to go, I called this friend of mine who who was dressed and did models, and I said, "What shall I wear right. and she told me, me you know told me exactly what to wear understated elegance mm -hmm. and um, then I had another friend who had had worked for the government, and he gave me a few things about the interview. Most of these things I knew except to have someone refresh it with yes. you, but I was very comfortable during the interview over there the entire time. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that he told me that, that, I, that I like to repeat, this is trivia, but at any rate, he said, and don't, don't get the most expensive thing on the menu when you go to lunch. Mm. And so, uh, so sure okay. enough, the, the, uh, the person who was interviewing me said to me, the, some kind of steak is delicious. And I said, mm. oh, I do like liver, I really do. I don't cook liver but I like it. So I said, I see liver and I'm gonna have the liver with fried apples. 
and, and uh, this is going to be great. And it was, it was delicious. And so I always think of that, and I don't know if he was trying me. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but I mean, these are so important for especially young people today. Yes, And often absolutely. we think the jobs that we're in, I've got the job because it's the best job your family has ever had. Right. But what you were saying to me before was, you know, you really experienced the, a real job yeah. where you have the perks. Have the perks, and, and, and we had the perks. And it was rather interesting the things that we don't know so much. And I marvel at the wisdom of my son, even at high school. When I was preparing for the job, my brother who lived there said, uh, why are you going over there? You, you could be the next supervisor. Well, you sit waiting for the supervisor to leave, and especially <laughs> being black, I mean, you know. You might never go. So, uh, so uh, I said, no, I'm going. And then uh, when I started to jockey about the uh, salary, my son reminded me of the perks. Mm. He said, you, you have an expense account and you have housing allowance away. And he went on to tell me all the things. So you, you are worrying about the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I said to him in the car, I told him, I said, I think I'm ready to go, except I haven't drawn my retirement from, from uh, Cleveland. And he said, Mama, do you need that money? And I said, not really. He said, well, I think you should leave it for retirement. And that was the best piece of advice I've wow. ever had. I left it, it was only $8,000, but I left it there, and that retirement is wonderful it now, grows. including my hospitalization. Mm. And uh, I, tell, I tell my family that, but I don't, it, it's not, it hasn't gotten through yet. <laughs> As we we'll were talking about this. <laughs> we'll keep on trying to teach them. Yes. I tell you, he's telling me I have two minutes. But I just want us to close and, and, and just give some words of wisdom. We're going to have a part two because we're not going to let you go. But just to say some words about, um, just some words from what we've said in part one, and then we'll go into part two. Well, well one, uh, I, I think having a, um, a curious nature, wanting to know things, not being satisfied in one rut. Mm. Um, when, when my children were going to college, my daughter, who's very bright, decided she, she didn't want to go to college, and, but my son always knew he was going. And so I listened to her a while, and I said to her, honey, you are going to college. You are going to get a degree. <laughs> well, what am I going to get? I don't care what you get it in, veterinarians, anything. You are going to college. I don't want to hear any more about it. <laughs> So my brother said, well, if she doesn't want to go, you're wasting your money. I said, learning is never yes. wasted. Must learning is never about everything. And there is a point of recall. One of the things that was difficult for me was, was running into strange situations and not having a point of recall, mm. you know. And, and so that... That, that hurts. But having an inquisitive mind and learning the job you own, some mm. people never, never learn. And, uh, and you need to, to study and be involved. Thank you. We are going to break for part two. My audience, thank you for being with us. And stay tuned for part two, which is coming up. Thank you. And join us again on our next session of Africa's Vision Network. Thank you. That was good.